Hello, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Government Summit COVID-19 and Government webinar series. Today's session is titled COVID-19, the new historic divide. Before introducing our esteemed panelists, I'd like to mention that we do have live Q&A. So please do send in your questions and mention the country you are sending your question in from and organization. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Tom Fletcher, who was also the UK ambassador to Lebanon during, uh, from 2011 to 2015, and is also a visiting professor at New York University in Abu Dhabi, and the author of The Naked Diplomat. Tom Fletcher, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Reem, and um, it's great to be part of this uh, conversation. I'm thrilled to be here. We've got a fantastic hour ahead of us uh, with Thomas Friedman, who, as you all know, has won three Pulitzers, is a best-selling uh, novelist. Um, he also, by the way, wrote the book that first inspired me to, to go out to the Middle East as a teacher and then inspired me 10 years ago to go to uh, Beirut as, uh, as ambassador. So we're really looking forward to this conversation today. We've decided, by the way, uh, for practical purposes, I am, I'll be Tom and, and he'll be Thomas so that we don't think that we've turned up in some kind of advert for a, a sat-nav uh, system. Um, I'd love to hear your questions. Do get them into us and I promise we'll get to them as fast as we can. Uh, but for now, please join me in, in welcoming the brilliant uh, Thomas Friedman. Great to be with you, Thomas. Great. Um, are you, uh, have you got your video up and running? Uh, okay. Thomas, my video. The host has stopped it. It says the host has stopped it. We'd love to see you. The host has stopped it. Okay. All right. Now we're there. Terrific. Great there we are. Yeah, thanks well, so much. It, it's great to see you. And um, Thomas, here we are um, emerging, we hope, we hope emerging uh, from this ex extraordinary period of um, fragility, uh, instability, this sense of uh, a driverless uh, world. How, how do you, as an analyst, someone who thinks deeply about these issues, how do you even begin to write about a pandemic uh, like COVID-19? Um, well, Tom, it's a great, uh, great place to start. I just want to welcome everyone at the World Government Summit. Uh, thanks uh, to all my friends in Dubai for organizing this. Great to be with y'all wherever you're sitting. So um, I think one of the biggest challenges in thinking through um, the whole coronavirus pandemic uh, is that you have to put yourself in the lens, uh, in the mind of thinking about the world through nature, through the natural world. And when I try to explain that to people, um, I basically you know, start by saying that um, my daughter works at National Public Radio and on Easter Sunday uh, on NPR, they um, uh, did a roundup of pastor sermons from all over America, the best pastor sermons. And my favorite was a sermon given by Pastor Michael Curry at the National Cathedral. And he ended his Easter sermon by um, singing a little song. He sang, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. And, well, Thomas, just substitute he for she, Mother Nature, and she's got the whole world in her hands. Now, unless you happen to be 103 and we're here for the 1918 pandemic, basically no one in our generation of human species has been alive when she got the whole world in her hands. When we as a species, are all collectively facing the same uh, fastball, the same challenge being thrown by mother nature at her species or human species at the same time. And the fastballs that mother nature throws at us, they can be viruses, they can be germs, they can be floods, they can be droughts, they can be wildfires, they can be destructive storms. Whatever they are, they're mother nature's way of sorting out the fittest. Who shall get their DNA into the next generation, human, plants, animals? Now, 
um, when Mother Nature throws her fastballs at you as a species, she actually does not reward the strongest. Uh, she does not reward the smartest. She actually only rewards one attribute. She only rewards the most adaptive. Who can adapt most effectively to my latest challenge? And in asking for adaptation, she only looks for three attributes, three adaptation strategies. That's all she rewards. The first is, are you humble? Do you respect my virus? Because if you don't, it will hurt you or someone you love. Second, she asks, are you coordinated? Are you coordinated? Because I, Mother Nature, evolved my virus, viruses over millennia to find any crack in your immune system your personal immune system, and your communal immune system. So are you coordinated? And lastly, she says, are you building your response, your adaptation response on chemistry, biology, and physics exclusively, and not on politics, ideology, or an election schedule? Because I, Mother Nature, I'm just chemistry, biology, and physics. You can't talk me up, you can't talk me down, you can't say, Thomas, I, I'm having a, a, a recession now. Could, could you get Mother Nature to take some time off? She's going to do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate, and she always bats last, and she always bats a 1,000. Do not mess with Mother Nature. So if your adaptation strategy is not built exclusively on chemistry, biology, and physics, if it's ideology, politics, and elections, she will hurt you or someone you love. Now, what is the ideal strategy from the beginning, at least as I argued, the ideal adapt state, adaptation strategy? We needed an adaptation strategy that maximized two things, saving lives and saving livelihoods. Saving lives and saving livelihoods. Every country needed a sustainable strategy to simultaneously save lives and livelihoods because if you just focus on saving lives, you'd shut everything down and you destroy your economy. If you just focused on jobs, you would risk hundreds of millions of people to a pandemic. So everyone's been in search of that sweet spot or should have been of how you save lives and livelihoods because there's a lot of ways to die. You can die of COVID-19 and you can die a death of despair, of unemployment, of lost hopes, lost lives, lost businesses. So uh, the social determinants of health are as important as um, you know, the, the virus issues. So what you see around the world are three different approaches to trying to save lives and livelihoods at the same time. One approach is the Chinese, uh, which is to use their giant state system and it's all, all its apparatus to um, test, track, and trace, and quarantine uh, people with the virus in hopes of keeping it under control long enough until we get herd immunity through a vaccine. There's only two ways to overcome a pandemic. Well, so there's only one way to overcome a pandemic and that's with herd immunity. And there's only two ways to get herd immunity. One is with a vaccine of 60 to 70% of your population so that the virus runs out of protoplasm to infect. And the other is by naturally acquiring the virus developing the natural antibodies to it with 60 to 70% of your population and the virus runs out of people to infect. So the Chinese are using a kind of state top-down control model, keep the virus under control till we get a vaccine and get herd immunity. And then there are various, I'd call democratic variants of that, South Korea, uh, you know, New Zealand, um, uh, uh, the UK, you know, uh, et cetera. Second model is the one that Sweden uh, adopted. They don't really like to call it that, but they really did adopt a model that basically said, we're going to keep our economy as open as we can. We're still going to shut down a lot of things, but keep it open. We're going to close colleges and universities, but K, let K through nine schools continue to operate. We're going to ask people to social distance. We're going to try to protect our elderly, and then we're going to let actually go into the workforce and actually acquire the disease um, and develop the natural antibodies to it, um, the young and healthy, because this disease um, actually affects a lot of people a little and a few people a lot. And so we're going we're gonna to go for natural herd immunity. 
Now, what Sweden will tell you today is they did a very poor job of protecting their most vulnerable, their elderly, um, and suffered uh, uh, more deaths there than they certainly hoped to or wanted to. Um, but the book is still out on Sweden. We'll, we'll see. A herd immunity, naturally, um, uh, they may get there before others. I just don't know. Uh, the third model is the American model. And that is we talk like we're going to be like China. We kind of act like we're trying to do Sweden. We um, pretend that we're better than both. And we actually are preparing for neither. The American Trump approach is what the hell? I've locked down. I'm tired of this virus. Um, uh, stop testing. Stop telling me how many people have it. Um, uh, go back to work. Uh, have fun. And, um, and we've got a, basically a giant mess on our hands. So that's how I would look at it um, uh, generally. And is it too soon to say which of, the, which of those plans, which of those adaptations is, is, is going to be the most successful? I think it is, um, Thomas, because um, look at China today. Look at, look at even South Korea today. The, the virus is coming back because you know, a lot of people point to New Zealand. They've done a fantastic job. But, well, look, at, if you're an island country in the you know, South Pacific, um, you can, you actually can, you know, shut down enough and track, trace, and test and quarantine. But New Zealand just has one little problem, just, just one little problem. The minute they open up, the virus comes back. Okay. So, uh, you know, don't, in the minute anybody, I go back to my first point, Thomas. If you are not humble, when you are facing mother nature, she will hurt you or someone you love. Okay. This virus wants to infect everybody on the planet. We're all just delicious protoplasm for it, okay? And it doesn't go away because you lock down, doesn't go away because you shake your fist at it. It only goes away when you have herd immunity to it and it will keep looking for people to infect um, until you get there. And so uh, I, I think one has to give credit to Taiwan in particular, actually more than any, um, uh, uh, but South Korea, uh, China, they've gotten their economies back going uh, to a higher degree than others, um, and but they continue to track, test, trace, and quarantine at a really rigorous rate, which in the West challenges some real civil liberties. Because uh, in China, they can take your temperature, find that you um, are uh, a carrier, and then um, you don't even get to go back home. You get quarantined in a government house uh, for, you know, for a couple weeks at least, or you end up in the hospital. So um, th that, that approach is not for everybody. But um, uh, nobody's, I think, found the, the perfect approach. Maybe that Taiwan has done the best. And that's not an accident because Taiwan had SARS. And so they had the experience of going through the SARS epidemic and were right on top of this. America is far and away the worst. America and the UK. It's interesting um, that actually all, all three of those adaptation methods you mentioned all rely to some extent, not just on social distancing, but on, on national distancing. They're all very national based strategies, country strategies. It, is there a fourth strategy around some form of, of more coherent international coordination, a bit like the G20 managed to pull together 10 years ago? Or, or have, we, have we broken the world? Well, let's talk about that a little bit, Thomas. I think it's a really important point. I, I did an essay um, uh, three weeks ago called How We Broke the World. And it started with me looking back at the stories I'd been covering for the last 20 years. And I noticed that um, I've actually been covering pandemics for the last 20 years. They were just in different forms. I covered a geopolitical pandemic called 9-11. Then I covered a financial pandemic called 2008. Then I covered a biological pandemic called COVID-19. And I'll soon be covering an atmospheric pandemic called climate change. So I sat back and thought, well, wh why are pandemics are us now? Wh why is it? Why every seven eight years or so, we have one of these global shaking events. And the reason uh, I believe that's happening is because three things have converged at the same time. Uh, the first is the world is flatter than ever. That is globalization has tied the world together. Not only more nodes in more places, in more ways on more days are tied together, but the system now is so much faster and more greased. And, and, and its interconnectedness. So for instance, I pointed out in that article that between December 2019 and March 2020, excuse me, 
um, when the virus was really spreading the most. There were 3,200 direct flights from China to the United States in that period. Um, there were 50 direct flights from Wuhan to the United States. From Wuhan. Who knew? How many Americans had even heard of Wuhan? Okay. So you see how globalization has just gotten so much more intense. So that, that's been going on. On the other side of that, what we have been doing as uh, humans is we've been taking the buffers out all over the place. We've been taking buffers out that buffered instability. So in the ecological realm, we took natural buffers out. Where did SARS come from and where did the coronavirus likely come from? It came from the fact that we have been expanding urban areas into wildlife areas. And when we do that, what we end up doing is killing the apex predator in these, uh, these pristine ecological zones. When you kill the apex predators, what you end up with is um, only the generalized species, bats, rats, and primates, basically, who can live in destroyed ecosystems. Now, these bats, rats, and primates all co-evolve in the wild with their viruses over millennia, okay? But when you then destroy their apex predators, they proliferate, then you go in and hunt them, and then you take them out, and you put them into urban settings, into wet markets, and you sell their meat next to domesticated meat, or you simply have them there and they bite a human or they bite another mammal that a human bites into, suddenly you get this spread of zoonotic diseases that jump from these uh, species that evolved with these viruses in the wild and they jump to human beings. That's where SARS came from out of Guangzhou and that's where um, uh, COVID-19 likely came from, but we don't know exactly. So we're, removed, we're moving buffers with the natural world. We're removing buffers um, uh, in the financial world. Uh, now computers trade with computers in milliseconds without any human buffer at all. We're removing buffers online I can now go on Twitter and Facebook and spread some crazy rumor all over the world without an editor and removing buffers in supply chains. Everything's now just in time, just in time. So we woke up and discovered we, we didn't have enough cotton swabs in America, cotton swabs, okay? Because we were on just in time supply chain. So now to put those two together, we've wired the world together more intensely than ever before. We've greased the system to make that interconnectivity faster than ever. Then we took out the buffers and then we did the stuff human beings always do. We did crazy stuff. We always go to extremes. We chase tulips. We, we engage in uh, ideological uh, and extremist violence. We do all these things. But now when you do those crazy things in a world that's so fused together, that is so greased with so few buffers, your ability to transmit instability now from one node to the entire system is vastly expanded. And if you follow the history of these four pandemics, as I call them, you see in each case, we first had a warning heart attack and then we got the full coronary. So in 1993, a guy named Ramzi Youssef tried to blow up the World Trade Center. It didn't work. And in 2011, we got the full coronary with Osama bin Laden. In 1990, I wrote, forgot the date of 1998, a hedge fund in America called Long-Term Capital Management amassed a trillion dollars in leverage, okay, because the buffer of transparency was, uh, was removed and each bank didn't know what the other was doing. They almost melted down the entire Wall Street, except the Fed stepped in. That was the warning heart attack. In 2008, we got the full coronary uh, called the 2008 Global Recession and Mortgage Banking Crisis. In 2002, we had a coronavirus, um, uh, effectively COVID-1. It was called SARS. It came out of Guangzhou, um, was spread to the world when a doctor from Guangzhou was infected, went to Hong Kong and checked into hotel room 911. Yeah, can't make that up. And that was the um, uh, warning heart attack. We were able to, to, to stem the spread of SARS. Why? because we had the buffer of collaborative government. We had a buffer of governments collaborating. And of course, in 2019, we got the full coronary heart attack uh, without the buffer of governments cooperating. And finally, we're now in a rolling um, warning heart attack on climate change. 
and beware about climate change because unlike a coronavirus, climate change doesn't peak. It doesn't hit a peak and then disappear. No, no, no. When we melt the polar ice caps, they'll be gone, all right? Um, uh, we will not have their reflectivity of the sun's rays. We're going to raise the ocean and we're going to boil the ocean. When we flip the Amazon from a rainforest to a savanna, that's it. It's, it's no longer a rainforest. So there, and there is no herd immunity to climate change. There's just an endless pounding on the herd. There is one difference though with climate change. We already have the vaccine. We already know what it is. And that's lowering CO2 emissions. Uh, uh, so we prevent um, uh, global temp average temperature rising beyond 1.5 uh, uh, degrees. So, um, or two degrees. So that's basically what, what's going, that's the global reason in my view, Thomas, that we're having all these pandemics now more and more often. And, and so I wondered, extending that analogy, whether the election of Donald Trump in 2016 was the, the warning heart attack or the full coronary, because what we've seen, you mentioned the weakness of the US response to the virus, and every morning the president seems more and more determined to prove his critics right. But also he's, he's vandalized many of those buffers in the international system that you mentioned. Uh, really, yeah. Can we, you know, can we look forward, do you think, to a, a, a change in American leadership, you know, a return of American leadership in dealing with these challenges? Will America go from being a problem on the list to deal with, to back to being a, you know, on the list of countries that, that manages these problems again after November? Vandal vandalize is a really good um, uh, description of what uh, Trump is doing. You know, historically, Thomas, if you look at the, the other pandemics, America's role always was threefold. One is um, we were the ones who coordinated the world. We, we created the coordination. We galvanized people together, states and individuals, to face whatever that challenge was of, of the pandemic, number one. Number two, we gave aid and comfort um, to the people who were most harmed by it. That was what we saw our role. And thirdly, we... Um, uh, um, we provided the scientific foundation for whatever the right answer was. You know, well today our president is galvanizing nobody. It's all America first. Um, we are giving aid and comfort to no one, and rather than being a source of scientific learning and knowledge and expertise, um, we've been in the business of making the world stupid. Um, we have a president who suggested maybe it'd be a good idea to have a, um, uh, an, an enema with disinfectant. Uh, or a um, colonoscopy with ultraviolet light. Um, you know, every day he comes out with another whack job idea. Trump is a moron, um, uh, if you haven't uh, uh, realized that. I think more and more Americans are realizing that. But as president of the United States, he is a really dangerous moron. And in the midst of all, this is pretty bleak. Uh, you know, you've, you've got all these buffers being knocked out. You've got that lack of American leadership. You've got this a fairly deplorable, woeful uh, presidency at the moment. Um, you know, a question we got from, uh, from the audience already is, are you an optimist or a pessimist at the end of all this? You've, you've mentioned several facts, and people sometimes say a pessimist is an optimist armed with facts. Uh, can, can you give us any reasons to be cheerful? Drugs, a lot of drugs. <laughs> okay, no, don't tweet that, it's just a joke. Okay, um, so, uh, Yes, I, I can. First of all, if you look at the polls in America, um, as, as we sit here today, uh, a, a clear majority of Americans want to replace this president um, and not give him four more years. I'll believe that the morning after the election, but you know, right now that is a source of some, some hope. Um, I do believe that um, you know, we're in a race, basically, Thomas, between what I call COVID's law and Moore's law. All right, so COVID's law is the rate at which um, uh, the coronavirus spreads around the world. And it's at an exponential rate. It's not an exponential curve. Um, but, and Moore's law is the rate at which computers improve their capacity, uh, that they double their speed and power roughly every uh, 24 months. And so um, uh, there's kind of a race between the increasing brain power of the world and Mother Nature's natural exponential spread of this virus. And I actually believe that in this case, Moore's law will defeat COVID's law, that um, by uh, you know, 2021, we will have a vaccine. And um, I, that's, that is my hope. Uh, it's not based entirely on nothing. You read the reports coming out of Oxford in particular, where you'll be going, Thomas. 
um, which seems to be in the lead uh, on this in terms of already going into human trials. And um, that's the one thing I am hoping for because uh, it's clear to me my government is not capable of managing this crisis. Um, you know, a friend of mine, um, Michelle, um, uh, uh, um, I'll think of her last name in a second, uh, Gelfand um, has done a lot of research on what she calls tight and loose cultures. So uh, tight cultures are very top-down, they're order-bound, very rule-abiding. Um, think Germany, think uh, China, uh, think, think uh, Singapore, uh, it's not a lot of East Asian countries. Uh, loose cultures are very non-top-down, uh, not um, authority-bound, uh, aren't really good at, at following rules. And what you find is that um, uh, tight cultures are much better dealing with a pandemic than loose cultures. And America today is the mother of all loose cultures, and you can really see it playing out in the completely incoherent response. Um, and the sort of madness of people using wearing a mask as a proxy for whether you're a liberal or a conservative, not whether you're smart or dumb. And um, so it's, uh, it, it's been very challenging. And, and in the absence, in that vacuum of American uh, leadership, and in fact, when you look around the Security Council table, you see a number of countries that uh, classically export solutions, now they're exporting problems. Um, when, when you look around the world now, who, which countries will step up, do you think, and, and, and take some of the slack, take some of the leadership? Well, I'm, uh, I don't take this the wrong way. It's not meant as jingoism, but I believe that if America doesn't lead, nobody leads. Uh, it's not like China's gonna lead. China cannot lead the world by giving people free masks while masking where the coronavirus came from, which is what they've been doing. Or telling countries like Australia and doing that we won't buy your beef or your barley if you demand an independent inquiry into the origins of coronavirus. So I don't see China particularly leading the world. Yeah, they can you know, give aid here and there to smaller and more needy countries. Um, the, the European Union's completely divided, um, uh, licking its own wounds. Um, India really can't. So basically when America leads, nobody leads. Um, and that's kind of what's going on right now. Yeah. So vacancy makes us, again, less coordinated and less effective against the virus. Yeah. Vacancy still open. There's a great question in actually just changing tack slightly. A great question in from the national uh, newspaper here, actually about the, the effect of the, uh, the lockdown on you personally. So, you know, given that you're from a profession which is very much about getting out and, and meeting people, you know, that, that last three feet, that human connection uh, that really makes a difference to great, great journalism, I'd say to great diplomacy as well and great writing. How, how, how has it affected your writing and, and your outlook personally? Well, first of all, you know, I'm a big fan of The National. I've got their app on my phone and they have a great editor, Mina El Raibi. So um, uh, I, I would simply say this, um, you know, it's very strange. I've, I've been a home. Um, uh, obviously, it's the New York Times closed its offices the first week in March. And we just announced yesterday we're not coming back to our offices till January 2021. So um, I've been doing a lot of webinars and it's very funny, you know, Thomas, I, uh, I had a day a few weeks ago where um, uh, I did a webinar in India in the morning on the India Today platform. I then spoke to 82 UN ambassadors for the small states coalition at the UN. And in the evening I did a webinar with the Bauer Forum in China and I never left my chair. And at each one of those webinars, someone asked me, was globalization over? <laughs> and I said, really? Um, I've never acted more globally than I am today. And my argument, remember, in the world is flat, is that what I meant by the world is flat was that um, more people in more places, in more ways, on more days can now act globally as individuals. But that was the new thing. You had to, it used to be apt to be a country to act globally. Then you had to be a company to act globally. Now, thanks to Zoom, um, you and I and our hosts in Dubai, we are acting globally as individuals. I'm here in Bethesda, you know. So my routine is I've been doing, you know, um, uh, three or four of these a week of different kind. I've been interviewing people around the world, staying in touch with friends uh, through Zoom. Um, it isn't as good as going. It isn't nearly as good as going, of course. But you know what, Thomas? It's about 85% is good. And when I get done with this phone call, I will not have 12 hours of jet lag. Um, and so, uh, so I kind of, you know, th that's my day. I do this a, a lot. I, I um, exercise. Um, and then every evening, my wife and I watch an episode of Gilmore Girls, um, which was a, 
um, uh, basically a 1990s uh, show in America, very popular. Um, it's about a small town in Connecticut, and it's all about family, friends, relationships, um, and community. It's a wonderful antidote to COVID-19. Uh, it was on for seven years, 22 episodes. We're now in season five, episode five, and my hope is that we'll have a vaccine by the time we hit the end of the show. Fantastic. Um, you reminded me of, of being, when I was posted in um, Paris, seeing, that, seeing a demonstration downtown and, and asking, what are you protesting about? And they said, we are the global campaign against globalization. <laughs> it's right. I've got um, a very good question actually from, uh, from the audience. Uh, what about the positives uh, of, the, uh, of the pandemic? You know, not least that we've understood really what we have been doing to the environment and, and what we need to stop. Can we, how do we sustain some of those positives as we, as we reopen? It's a very good question, you know, um, and uh, I, I do think it has real, I, I think that the debate around climate change, God willing, we get a vaccine here in the next year. I think the debate about climate change will be very different on the other side of this pandemic. People are going to realize that um, you do not want to court a pandemic uh, with climate change. You know, Thomas, a friend of mine, um, Hal Harvey, who's a great energy innovator uh, in San Francisco, he sent me a note the other day. We were just talking about something, but he ended his note um, with, three, with a, uh, three phrases. He said, respect science, respect nature, respect each other. And I thought, you know, if Joe Biden's looking for a simple bumper sticker, um, but all of us, any leader around the world, if you don't come out of this virus by respecting science, respecting nature, and respecting each other, because in America in particular, you know, the same people who um, are protesting in the streets over Black Lives Matter are the same people who have been more disproportionately hurt by coronavirus, are the same people who live in housing that doesn't allow them to do social distancing, you know, and are the same people, in many cases, who we're now so dependent on. They're the people driving the trucks of the groceries around the country. They're the people stocking the grocery, grocery shelves where people all around them come in, buy their food and cough on them. Um, and we really need to think about the social order uh, and how we reward and take care of people at the bottom of the period. I'm sorry it took a pandemic to do this, but I sure hope that one of the byproducts of that is how we really look at the social order, minimum basic income, um, uh, and some of the inequality issues that this is so exposed because viruses expose every crack in your system and um, every vulnerability. They expose strengths too, but they also expose vulnerabilities. And uh, one of them uh, in America has clearly been um, around the treatment of black and brown people. I'm getting a lot of questions on, uh, on Lebanon inevitably, and you and I could probably spend several days now uh, reminiscing and, and debating Lebanon, but I want to zoom out a little bit just from Lebanon itself and, and ask, you know, your, your, your famous hammer rules uh, in, in the great book from Beirut to Jerusalem are on the wall of, of many ambassadors, including uh, this one and, and who are working in the Middle East. You know, that idea that if you, if you intervene in the Middle East, it often bites you back. If you fail to intervene, it often bites you back. And what we've actually ended up doing instead is lurching in and out and getting bitten on the way in and on the way out. Um, looking around now, you know, several years on, uh, ha have you updated your sense of, of how we should approach the Middle East? Um, you know, um, I get a lot of flack sometimes for some of the positions I've taken. I supported the Iraq war for democracy reasons, not WMD reasons, you know. Uh, I was very excited about the Arab Spring. Um, I was initially very hopeful about MBS in Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, as an agent of change. And um, uh, people often ask me, you know, um, uh, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, on the one hand, you were all for getting rid of one dictator in, Saudi, in, 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 um, uh, in, in Iraq. You supported the Arab Spring. It was like you were excited about getting rid of every Arab dictator. Um, then you supported MBS, you know, um, like what's that about? What's the common denominator there? And for me, I just have to tell you the common denominator is that um, I go back to the um, uh, UN Arab Human Development Report, uh, which came out in 
2001, and I'm a big believer of it. Um, I, I believe um, the thing that will most transform uh, the Arab Muslim world today um, is when it sees a proliferation of gender pluralism, education pluralism, uh, religious pluralism, and political pluralism. And I think countries that um, are able to make progress uh, steadily on gender pluralism, religious pluralism, uh, education pluralism, and political pluralism uh, empower their people more, men and women, and will thrive better in the world. And that's the common denominator behind everything I've ever supported. Wherever I saw an opportunity um, to get behind the hope for gender pluralism, education pluralism, political pluralism, and religious pluralism, I, I pushed it. I'm, I'm so sorry that many of them failed. Um, I couldn't be more pained by the cost of that, but um, I do believe that is the way forward. Um, and that countries that find their way uh, toward that kind of pluralism will thrive in the 21st century and countries that don't um, will not thrive. And um, so I believe that then, I still believe it now. Um, uh, I've always you know, been a fan of, of um, uh, things like uh, this World Government Summit that are promoted by the UAE. Um, uh, it has its critics, it has its supporters, but on balance, I think it's pushing um, uh, certainly the religious pluralism, education pluralism, and gender pluralism. Um, and um, and that's, that's just so important. And um, uh, I was in love with Lebanon, still am, um, have so many friends there and because I was there at a really key moment um, in 1982. Uh, I was on the Titanic with a lot of people who are still dear friends of mine. And Lebanon stood out for so many years because it had gender pluralism, religious pluralism, education pluralism, and political pluralism. That, that was its, it's the secret of its sauce. That's what distinguished it. And I'm sorry to see a lot of that choked and snuffed out um, uh, in, in some ways um, for a lot of political reasons that I won't go into here, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get just a little controversial. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, Thomas, uh, since what the hell, that's what people turned in for. I did a column after the killing of Soleimani, you know, in Iran, um, in which uh, it got a lot of attention because I basically said that America had just assassinated the dumbest man in Iran. And people said, what, 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 what are you talking about? And my point was, in a world where the Iranian people have so much talent, but can only thrive if they have political pluralism, gender pluralism, religious pluralism, and education pluralism. You had a leader, Soleimani, whose whole business model was to basically sow uh, division uh, in all the countries around it and try to create frail and, and broken states around it, one of them being Lebanon, in fact, okay? Um, that that was their business model. Well, now look at today. Look at today when all those wasted millions of dollars trying to create frail states throughout the Arab uh, world around them. Look at how that money has been wasted when Iran needs it most today. So like I'm a, I'm a hardliner on one issue, pluralism, gender pluralism, education pluralism, religious pluralism, and political pluralism. If you're pushing that, I'm your friend. If you're not pushing that, I'm not your friend. And yet that's a worldview. I mean, you're zooming out again from, from that point in the 80s and, and you know, that turning point really, the 89 that you've written about. Uh, so powerfully, you know, when you look at the world in 89, you know, we felt that it was, it was going in that direction. You know, of course we weren't all saying it was the end of history, but you know, Tiananmen Square tank man went viral before YouTube existed. Uh, you know, the, the Berlin wall was coming down, you know, campaigns were running in South Africa long before Twitter was created. You know, all of that, you know, pa that powerful moment in that sense, I think, I think for a generation actually of diplomats and politicians and maybe analysts as well, we did have that feeling that, that the world was ticking along in one direction. You know, the arc of the moral universe was bending uh, in, towards pluralism, if you like. And yet, you know, the last four or five years, 2016 onwards, and, and maybe this pandemic too, which has strengthened the view of many that authoritarian regimes are better at dealing with pandemics than, than more open liberal regimes, you know, is the arc of history still bending in that direction? 
Well, I'd, I'd say one thing quickly and then one thing in, at length. You know, one thing the pandemic shows is actually, it doesn't matter whether you have authoritarian government, democratic government, liberal government, progressive government, Tory government, or Republican government. What matters is if you have good government. And if it, you know, and you can have good governments that are more authoritarian um, uh, or less democratic, and you can have good governments that are democratic and really bad governments that are democratic. So, to me, what what has stood out here is whether you have strong and healthy institutions, public health institutions, um, uh, in, in particular, and good governance is what really stands out. So, you know, let me take you back because um, here I, I'm going to um, talk about a book that. Um, uh, is still really, in many ways, my favorite. It's a book I wrote in 1999 called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. Um, and The Lexus and the Olive Tree, what was it about? It was basically saying, trying to answer the question you just posed, Thomas. Um, uh, and the question is, um, what, was this, what will be the system that replaces the Cold War system? Because the Cold War was a system of two superpowers competing and with a web of states aligned to both. And that's how we managed the world. Um, and uh, basically, there were several big, really, really big cracks uh, uh, at, at uh, uh, takes at what is the system that will replace the Cold War system? The first and most famous was Frank Fukuyama. He said it'll be the end of history, that eventually the arc of history will bend toward liberal governments and free markets, that they will win. And uh, that's what he meant by the end of history. And let's give Frank at least some credit. He's premature, <laughs> okay? Um, uh, that didn't play out uh, uh, for all the reasons you just cited. The second was um, uh, Sam Huntington. He said, oh, what will replace the Cold War system will be uh, a war of civilizations. Well, you know, actually we've seen more wars within civilizations in the Middle East, Sunnis versus Shiites in places like Lebanon um, than we have actually between civilizations. So that, that didn't really, you know, hold up. Uh, another was Robert Kaplan. Uh, he said it'll be the coming anarchy. Anarchy everywhere. Well, there's been some, but not everywhere. Um, and the fourth was the Lexus and the Olive Tree, or, you know, what was another one. And what I basically said is what will replace the Cold War system is an interaction between what is really old and what is really new. What is really old are our olive tree urges, the things that anchor us in the world, faith, nation, community, tribe, sect, family, okay? All of these, these sort of uh, nationalist um, sort of tribal urges intersecting with what is totally new, this globalization system. And that global politics will be about the intersection between the two. So Vladimir Putin will seize Crimea. He'll seize Crimea, but he won't go to Kiev because he knows the globalization system will hammer him. Every day China will threaten Taiwan, eh, Taiwan, we're gonna, but they haven't invaded yet because so many supply chains between Taiwan and China undergird the Chinese economy. So my argument is if you wanna understand international relations today, it's actually an interaction between our tribal, our social, our olive tree urges, all the things that make us human and connect us to one another and our homes interacting with this totally new thing, this globalization system. And I think that that framework still holds up. Yeah. Um, I, I've just been told we have only five minutes to go. So I'm gonna do two quick fire questions actually. Um, firstly, this, this is a great question from uh, an audience member. What about the tech? I mean, here we are, uh, co-video conferencing. You know, we don't know yet whether we'll work for the robots, our kids will work for the robots or the robots will work for them. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about what the tech will do to geopolitics? Well, it's all about what values we bring to it. So the tech alone isn't good or bad. Um, if you use Facebook to uh, create a global conference uh, for young people to talk about solutions to COVID-19 or climate change, tech is your friend. And if you use uh, Facebook to organize neo-Nazis around the world, uh, tech is your enemy. And one of the problems is that these, these social networks in particular have built into them a bias toward enra enragement. <clears throat> you know, the people who go viral the most in the world, uh, the people who spread COVID-19 the most are people who are loud and obnoxious in a closed room. And the people who spread hate on global networks the most are people who are loud and obnoxious on Facebook. So 
These bo both, you can go real viral in COVID-19 and on Facebook because they both reward people who are loud and obnoxious. And in all of that, one group that doesn't seem to get any airtime, any oxygen, we've not mentioned them today is, is the United Nations. You know, it's 75 years old this year. You know, September was meant to be this great gathering. Obviously that won't happen now to celebrate that. You know, the, the UN is uh, orphaned, gouty, stagnant, under-resourced, under-supported. Uh, can the UN be part of the, the fight back? Well, the UN wasn't, um, as you know, Thomas, it wasn't planted here from another planet. It, it doesn't exist in and of itself. It's only as strong as its members want to make it. And um, uh, when, when its most important member, the United States of America, doesn't want to make it strong because it's got a knucklehead president who thinks any multilateral organization just diminishes American power and maneuverability, then the UN is not going to be very strong. Uh, if we have another president, and God willing, we will uh, come November, uh, who has a different view about collaboration, because what isn't going to go away is this, whether the UN is effective or not. And I can end here, Thomas. We now face a whole set of issues that require global governance without there being global government. Okay, you cannot deal with a pandemic without global governance. You can't deal with cybercrime without global governance. We can't deal with climate change without global governance. Nance, okay? There's a whole set of issues that we are now fused together on. We aren't just interconnected. We're not just interdependent. We're now fused, okay? And without global governance, we're not gonna be able to manage any of those issues. But we have no global government. So it's gonna take, I think, a different kind of American leadership, the old kind of American leadership, of which there was much wisdom um, uh, in order to revive the, the UN, get us back to global governance, and get America back uh, to being America. That's the only way we'll be great again. I, I, time to squeeze in one last question because it's very relevant to a couple of the, the ideas that come through on the chat. I mean, we've been, we've been looking quite big picture, uh, geopolitics, big strategy, big picture stuff. Um, many people uh, watching may feel that they can't really influence all of that, uh, that they as individuals, even armed with all the, you know, the smartphone superpower, all that agency this gives us, you know, it's all just a bit too hard to influence. So if we could then zoom right in, you know, what would be your advice for them, for all of us as, as individuals approaching this very unstable, fragile moment as we emerge from the, the pandemic? Well, none of us as individuals, you know, are gonna be able to tip the world, you know what I mean? Um, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, the way I think of it, I'm, I've got my little platform at the New York Times, you know, uh, I'm, I'm blessed with that. But whoever you are, wherever you are, Start something with someone else. Start something with someone else. Build community. Build community where people can feel connected, protected, and respected. And build community around one of these three, to promote one of these three things. Respecting science, respecting nature, and respecting each other. You do that, you'll be making the world a better place. That is a great uh, note to finish on. I've actually got a, a book here of advice I've been collecting from world leaders over the years for my son, Charlie, who's 14. And time and time again, what comes through is be kind, be curious, and be brave. You know, we need the next generation to be kinder than we are, were. Yes. To reduce the inequality that you've spoken about, we need them to be more curious than we are, to yeah. push forward reason and, yeah. and science. Yeah. But we need them to be brave because you've described a pretty frightening world. And the answer to these ch challenges, the 21st century, is never going to be a bigger wall. No. Uh, somehow we have to get back, and you've spoken so powerfully about the, the pluralism and the coherence and that sense of community uh, that we need to get back to. So from my side, thank you so much. It's been a riveting uh, conversation. I've learned a huge amount. Uh, it's been terrific. I'm looking forward to the next book. Um, but no, I'm going to hand... I'll just leave you, if I could, with one thing to pick up on what you said. And my last book, Thank You for Being Late, I... I actually had a theme song and I actually explored whether I could buy this song. So when you open the book, it would play this song like a birthday card plays happy birthday. And the song is by one of my favorite singers. Her name is Brandi Carlisle. She's a wonderful country folk singer. And her song is called The I, E-Y-E. And the main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. We're all being asked to dance in a hurricane now. 
The I for me is the community, the healthy community, where people can feel connected, protected, and respected. It moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but creates a platform of, of dynamic stability, not frozen stability, but dynamic stability that can move with the storm. The world today is divided between leaders who are trying to promise their people a wall that will stop the storm and leaders who are trying to build an I to go with the storm. Build an I, don't build a wall. Terrific stuff. So we started and finished uh, with the song. Um, I'm going to hand back to Reem now, but Thomas Rubin, thank you so much for that conversation. And um, sure. uh, back to HQ, Reem. Thank you, Tom Fletcher. Thank you, Thomas Friedman. I think it's been a really insightful session for everyone who's tuned in. And also there's been a lot of questions that we haven't been able to get to. But I think one thing we can definitely say is that we started off with the question is, uh, is COVID-19 really uh, causing a new historic divide? I think it is up upon us to work collectively to actually shape a better future. And I think everyone who's even tuned in today is really optimistic about making that actually happen. So we need to find those ways of putting differences aside, building the community, Thomas, like you said, and really connecting the dots to make change actually happen. Thank you so much uh, to both the towns today. <laughs> and it's been a pleasure. Uh, I wish you all to stay safe. Uh, Thomas Fletcher, I know you are uh, heading back to the UK in a few days, so wishing you well there. And on behalf of everyone and the audience, thank you and take care and stay safe.